the reason I've got a few other pictures here is it's just a bit of background to coronaviruses. We wouldn't know about them at all unless it was for this lady here from Glasgow who discovered coronaviruses in the late 1960s. And they look a bit like this. And they're called coronavirus because they've got these crown-like uh, spikes on the outside. And if you look at coronavirus in terms of infectivity, normal flu is down here. If you have flu, you might infect one or two other people. If you have COVID uh, coronavirus, you will infect four to five other people. Um, so it's a highly infective virus. So what are the specific issues for bagpipes and bands? So nobody's uh, really done much research into whether musical instruments can uh, spread respiratory droplets other than into the Vuvuzela for some reason back in 2011, possibly re related to a recent World Cup. And in that study, they showed that um, instruments such as the Vuvuzela can spread respiratory droplets for a number of meters. We don't know if the bagpipe can spread respiratory droplets. There's an assumption that it might do. And whether uh, the other aspect of pipe bands, drummers have a risk from their instrument is, 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 is probably um, negligent, the, the risk from their actual instrument, but they've still got something they could be touching. They've got other people's instruments they can be touching. So there's all of those things to consider. And we also have to consider when we're talking about bagpipes and pipe bands is we have solo piping. Here's uh, Craig demonstrating solo piping. Obviously there's not much of an audience. I think he had a fairly sharp high G that day that put a lot of people off. And uh, here it is a standard sort of pipe band. I think Scottish power in this case. So obviously there are differences in the chances of someone playing a solo bagpipe or playing in a band in terms of passing on or getting infection. And then we have outdoor contests versus indoor contests. And obviously indoor contests might be an even higher risk of transmitting between players in a band or, or spectators. So all things to consider. So I thought, first of all, we consider is the bagpipe itself inherently a risky instrument? Um, bagpipes are consistently the butt of many jokes in the national press. People always want to associate bagpipes with being bad for your health. Um, and we're probably all aware of this article um, that was in a medical journal that was reported in the popular press last year about bagpipe lung, which was uh, not a very good article because I went and read it. Uh, but anyway, there are some important things about the bagpipe that might make it more risky than other instruments. So. There's a lot of airflow involved in um, having to sort of inflate the bag and play the instrument. So you need a flow rate of about 15 to 30 liters of air uh, a minute. And to put that in perspective, we use flow rates of oxygen giving to patients in the hospital of anything from sort of five to 60 liters a minute. So it's quite a lot of, of um, airflow. And the, the mean pressure is quite high uh, to get a sound out of a bagpipe, but not as much air pressure as you need in something like a trumpet. And that might have a reflection on how much an instrument can um, cause droplet spread. You get lots of breath condensing inside the instrument. There's lots of saliva when people are playing bagpipes. And there is the fact that coronavirus seems to prefer cold, wet environments. And we know that we know this from sort of outbreaks or hotspots in places like slaughterhouses. And pipers are disgusting individuals who are prone to mouth blowing the chatters of other pipers and doing all sorts of things when they're setting up a band. And bagpipe hygiene, if we call it that, is suspect at best, even at the highest level of piping. So the main things that might be a worry about the bagpipe are, could it be aerosol generating? So could you spread viral particles from an instrument? Could the instrument itself be a reservoir for viruses? So viruses can't replicate, remember, out with the human body, but they can sit around places and infect people from there. Um, but really any risk in, with coronavirus from the bagpipe I think is dependent on whether you have people who have the infection playing an instrument in the presence of people who don't have the infection. So and in terms of how risky are pipe bands, well there have been several outbreaks of um, several outbreaks of coronavirus associated with choirs. Uh, one significant outbreak in the States where one member of a choir with an infection managed to infect about 60 other people and two of those people died. So it's really quite important in terms of people who are up close, who are um, using instruments or voice that may have the potential to spread virus that we have this in mind. Um, 
outbreaks are far more common in indoor gatherings of people, whether it be music or otherwise, but even outdoor activities involving groups and aerosols can be, can be dangerous. And for that reason, choir singing is not allowed uh, out of doors in, the, in America at the moment. And there is some data from woodwind orchestras suggesting that perhaps woodwind instruments have got less spread of aerosol. However, none of that is peer reviewed. It's just sort of small studies that have been quoted in the press. And the other thing to remember is piping and pipe bands are, are very social activities. So we all love the beer tent, whether we're there for alcoholic beverages or just, just chat. And there's a lot of time associated with, with piping and drumming that's spent chatting and being in close contact with people. So the last few slides are just to think, start thinking about how we might mitigate risk for individual teaching and band, uh, pipe band sort of uh, gatherings. So the first thing to say is we're potentially in for a long haul with this virus. Um, best case scenario is that we get um, a vaccine to then get some level of immunity in, in the population. And I'll, albeit that the government have said at UK level we'll have a vaccine by September, most people think that's highly unlikely. And it may be that we've got this virus with us for the next year or two, um, at least. So um, online teaching is being used by a lot of people and it's, it's not perfect, but it's a great temporary solution. And it would seem at the moment, based on the government guidelines, outdoor teaching would be possible one on one with, so with appropriate social distancing. And when we get to the point where we're allowed to interact indoors, when lockdown eases further, it, it would appear that you could do some creative things indoor with teaching. You could have a pupil in a practice room, teacher outside, for example. In that scenario, you might want to leave an, a, an appropriate distance of time between pupils. We would say an hour in hospitals if we're doing an aerosol generating procedure, um, just to allow uh, particles to, to leave the area or, or dissipate. Or you might even envisage basic PPE being used in the practice environment. So, in this country, we have gone for face masks as being the, the sort of major um, PPE that people will be using in public. In some parts of America, they use face shields extensively, and I, and I know these have been very successful in certain institutes in terms of universities where they've, they've shown no, no spread in between people working in, in the academic environment all wearing face shields. And that might be something that's possible to do. You could imagine sitting at a table, chanter practice, people with face shields on, um, practicing and um, but the important thing is you can only be teaching people if you have no symptoms or if your pupil has no symptoms and that is responsibility of you and your pupil um, and it comes down to the public health advice if you've got symptoms you shouldn't be going near anyone you should be isolating and getting a test another thing is about bagpipes in general I think introducing a level of hygiene would be appropriate this might not do anything for viral spread but it might just prevent one person from giving another person the virus and if it does just that alone you've had a big impact. So drying out your instrument properly. Viruses like damp areas, if you dry your instrument out, viruses will, will quickly die uh, by desiccation and even wiping down using proprietary sort of disinfectant wipes. Many of whom will say that they kill viruses but um, obviously you know you have to take that with a, a degree of or a pinch of salt. And what can we do about mitigating risk for bans? So again, I've, I've put the headline here, we're potentially into the long haul and we need to adapt. The first thing for bans and gatherings of people has to be the public health or government advice. In this case, we're in, we're in Scotland, but obviously all areas have their own advice. Um, social distancing, hand washing, hygiene, all of these things are really important. And when you have symptoms, you stay at home and you order a test. You just go, don't go anywhere near your pipe band. And you don't go to practice if you have symptoms. If you're running a band, you don't allow people in if, they've, if they have symptoms. You might want to formalize this by having an online form that people fill out before they go to band practice. I know that several gyms are planning to do this for when they reopen. And again, it's just making people aware that this is an important public health problem. And you have to address that every time you're gonna leave the house because you're not only thinking about your own risk, but you're thinking about the risk to vulnerable people you might come into contact with. Um, and once social distancing is relaxed out of doors and we're allowed to meet people from several different households, at the moment that's still restricted, it might be that limited band practices outside will be, will be something that, that, that can happen. But really that will be following public health guidelines at the time. 
And I think indoor practice is still out of the question in terms of bans at the moment until social distancing is relaxed. And when they do resume, it might be that things will have to be quite different than before. Um, and just to finish, some, some sort of controversial ideas that, you know, might not actually be that controversial. I was, I was discussing this with Craig yesterday. And we're saying if, you, if you'd had a conversation with someone in, in January and said, I'm thinking of wearing a face shield to ban practice tonight, you would have been, you would have been committed to a, a local hospital. But um, now it might be that we were thinking, can you wear a face shield and play the bagpipes in a band practice with your, with your other bandsmen, quite possibly? I've said elastic shields here, bit of a bit of a typo, but plastic shields are perspex shields between players as demonstrated um, here between two people. That might be a thing that's helpful. Could it be time to think about smaller pipe bands? The super pipe cores of 25 plus players just increase the risk of spreading pathogens hugely. And also social distancing becomes a real problem, particularly if we're looking at two meters, which has still not been relaxed. You know, it's gonna limit the number of players you can fit into a space. Um, and could it be time to refocus on smaller local pipe bands rather than the big flying outfits and operations we got used to? And also, because we might be in this for a long time, you know, this season has been canceled. It may be, uh, and John will, 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 will be speaking about this, I'm sure, uh, it, it's, we don't know if next year's pipe band season will go ahead either. So, you know, this is something you've got to think about. And it brings home our obsession with competition in both pipe bands and solos and whether we might have to readdress that in the short to medium term and think about other ways of enjoying uh, our music. And I don't want it all to be doom and gloom, but I think it's important, as with all... Uh, <laughs> with all messages about infectious diseases, um, that the only real way out of this is a vaccine. And if we get one by the end of this year, I will be delighted because it will mean that, you know, we can allow patients that we look after in the hospital to not be shielding for the rest of the year. Um, if we can suppress the virus and keep it suppressed, even without a vaccine, we might get to a situation where life will be more normal. But it's, there's always going to be the risk there and it's going to be about common sense, being responsible for yourself and also being thinking about others and assuming that you could at any point have this virus and can pass it on or someone else standing next to you might have it and can give it to you. And it's not a nice way to think about interacting with your friends and family, but it's the reality at the moment. Um, and most realistic predictions are thinking well, we won't be fully in control of this for at least a year or two. If we... If we have some major research breakthroughs, we might be in control of it sooner and that would be great, but just got to be prepared that this might be happening for quite some time. And just finally to close, um, pipe, piping and pipers have been associated with viral pathogens um, for many hundreds of years. And James Center, famous piper and composer, he died of pandemic, uh, the, 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 the pandemic Spanish flu in, um, 1918-1919 and also one of our one of our most famous and most beautiful pieces of music in the P, P rock repertoire the length the children was written in response to um the composer losing seven of his adult children to smallpox vaccine or was a smallpox uh, virus and the reason i show that as well is to say that smallpox used to be a major major killer worldwide and was a horrific disease but has been eradicated now so there is hope at all times with new pathogens, but it involves us all playing our part. So that's all I've got to say just now. And once we get to the Q&A session, you'll probably have more specific questions. So I'll just flip this back. Thank you very much, Robert. That's really interesting. Um, great, so if we just nip over to John now and just get a bit of a, an input from where the association are on things. Um, and then we'll start the, the Q&A after that. All right, thanks Craig, yep, I hope you can all hear me. Uh, thanks Robert for that. Uh, Robert and I had a chat last night and it was quite clear we were uh, both on the same page. Um, as a pipe band association, we have to uh, accept that things will need to change. Uh, it's unlikely this will be completely lifted by, by next year. Um, so we have to understand what we have to do if we want to get on the grass next year. Um, and at the moment, unfortunately, that is changing on a daily and, and weekly basis. 
and we're getting some guidance and then seven days later that guidance has changed again. So it is a bit of a bit of a challenge for us. Um, we have to accept that there will be some sort of social distancing in place come next season. Um, we need to be able to cope with that both within the performance area, but more importantly, within the social areas um, where you're spending seven or eight minutes in the, in the performance area and you're spending seven or eight hours in the social areas. So we have to work with the promoters to understand what we can, what we can do and how we can mitigate uh, some of that situation. And I was heartened to hear that um, at least beer gardens are opening uh, in, later on in the month. So it may well be that our beer tents become beer gardens. Um, however, um, we might need to give out free umbrellas, uh, knowing our climate and uh, just trying to keep us, keep us dry and keep us warm. Um, so we will have to work with our promoters um, to make sure that A, the environment that they're providing is, is suitable uh, for, for the event, but also the facilities which are, which are there. So hand washing, uh, sanitizing, uh, you know, beer tents, food, uh, queuing systems, all of that sort of stuff is going to have to be in place if we wish to um, actually have an event. Because at the moment, um, there is no facility for what they call a mass gathering, uh, either outdoors or indoors for that matter. Um, a mass gathering in, in government's terms is classed as anything over 500 people, uh, irrespective of how those people are made up. So whether that's per, uh, performers and competitors or whether it's uh, spectators. Um, so at this point in time, uh, there is no allowance for us to have a mass event or a mass gathering. Uh, that needs to change before we are actually in a position where we can have an event. And that's why, uh, as Robert was saying, we are still unsure as to when that will change or if that will change. Uh, and that's the challenges that, that we are facing at the moment. In the performance arena, um, if there is social distancing, so if it's two metres we can accommodate, you know, two meter social distancing between every player in the same size of arena as we currently have. So we know we can do that. Um, there are other options to change the format of how we do things. And some of those are being explored by our music board and our format group, just looking to see what the art of the possible really. Um, and so once we get some clarity from the government, um, and my understanding is that they are, they are publishing a set of guidelines um, for the music sector at some point in the next couple of weeks. Um, I think that's primarily set around wind instruments and, and brass bands, but it's, uh, it's likely that we could translate that into, into the pipe band world as well. So I'm, I'm keen to see uh, how that's coming out. And we're in regular contact, or I'm in regular contact with uh, Fiona Hislop, the culture secretary, and, and uh, Jason Leach, the clinical director, uh, just looking at to see what we can do um, so we're, 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 we've got our ear to the ground, we're, we're, keeping, we're keeping our hand in, um, but at the moment it, it's all about the guidance and following the guidance and, and as Robert said, we have a responsibility to make ourselves and our colleagues safe. Um, so it's about making sure your instrument is as good as it can be and making sure that you're, you're looking after it. There was something in today's uh, First Minister briefing that talked about getting back to um, sport uh, outdoor organised sport for uh, for children. Um, that gives me a little bit of hope that maybe we might be able to see that translated into juvenile pipe bands, you know, novice school bands and, and community bands in the juvenile and novice juvenile uh, arenas. Um, if they're allowing organised sport like football or rugby, then I think we could probably take the guidance that they have and make sure it's, it's appropriate for us. Uh, and I think that will all be about social distancing and, and cleanliness and, and looking after each other. So I'm hoping that that, that might give us a little bit of uh, help and a little bit of step towards where we're trying to get to. Uh, but it's at the moment it's sitting, waiting and listening and uh, doing what we can. That's all for me, Craig. Thank you very much. Um, that, was, that was great. So I'm just, we've got one question come in. I saw a couple of uh, funny little messages which made me laugh. One about Stephen Gerrard, which appealed to me very much. Uh, I, I think it was an accident. Um, so uh, there's a question here from Stuart Letford. I suppose it's to, to Robert. Do you have any information, or John actually, any information of any other uh, outbreaks related to musical groups in the UK? I think we talked about the choir. I think that was possibly in the United States. 
Um, have there been anything, is there anything else you've heard of in that sort of area? So in, ter in terms of the choir stuff, that, that there's been at least one outbreak in the States. That the stuff I showed you there was from the CDC website, and um, it's been very that's been very well in investigated. There's also been a choir outbreak in Japan. There was also the major cluster of cases in South Korea came from a church congregation, and uh, I, I don't think we would know to a certain extent if there had been an outbreak related to a choir, particularly not in England, because the the data we're getting at the moment is not um, is not that brilliant in terms of you know, individual outbreaks. We're just being told sort of headline numbers. Um, but it certainly suggests to me that these environments, when you've got a high, when you've got even one person who's got virus, you've got a potential to cause a lot of damage. So it's something that really should drive home how important it is to, when we do get back to that situation, to be, you know, practicing the appropriate distancing and hygiene. And the one for me, actually, um, we, we have a sort of big programme for quite a small school going on and we don't have enough drums to go around every, every drummer in the whole school, so we share, them out, share the equipment between bands. Um, so would, would the virus stay on a surface for, for a long time? Um, would a proper wipe down, you know, get rid of it? Um, would it be of any use? Um, or should it just be a blanket for the foreseeable no, no sort of sharing of equipment? No, so I mean, I, I don't think you'd be wanting to share bagpipes in the way that we're prone to. <laughs> um, but yeah, wiping things down with appropriate um, disinfectant and soap and water is, is good. So in the hospital, for example, we will uh, wipe down things like face shields and use them again after um, using stuff called Clorox, which is just, you know, a high grade disinfect disinfectant. But yeah, using common sense really is, is what we're talking about here. And um, yeah, wiping things down as long as you're using, you know, an appropriate um, wipe or, or, you know, alcohol spray of over 70%. Things, these, these things will kill the virus almost immediately. Um, and all of these studies that look at how long viruses lived on surfaces, to put that in perspective, you know, that the virus that they've, that they've got off, say, a bit of metal after uh, two or three days, that is that might be a really really small amount of virus. It's just that they're, they're culturing it in a lab, so it might be that um, that th it's usually the, or it's likely that it's the first few hours that something's been touched that it's got the most potential to spread something to someone else. But again, that's why you wash your hands, and that's why you shouldn't touch your face, and that's why wearing a mask actually reminds you of these things when you're out and about because you're like I'm wearing a mask, so that means that I'm in a situation of danger. Yeah, absolutely. Um, to John, one from Ian Simpson here, would we look at having sort of staggered competitions, um, i.e. different grades at different, you know, on different days? And I suppose I, I had a, a little um, question about that too, in terms of potentially capping numbers of bands and things to be able to fit into certain venues. Is that something we might have to end up? If the requirements and the guidelines are that, that it will take us longer to get a band into the competition arena, and they will stay in that competition arena longer, then we would need to obviously extrapolate the amount of time that we, that we give to each band. And at some point, um, we won't have enough time to run it all in the one day. Um, however, when you then start to run that over more than one day, the, the costs are exponential, um, you know, from the promoter's perspective, because traditionally we're using um, an area that's used for something else. You know, so it's not it's not a it's not a festival venue. It's not you know it's not a music venue. Um, so we we need to be looking at, at whether um, that's feasible for us to have it running over a Friday and a Saturday or a Saturday and a Sunday, and that brings on in all other sorts of, of issues. As we know, when we tried the the two day worlds a couple of years ago uh, on a Saturday and Sunday, so th these are all challenges that we that we have to step up and step up and meet. Um, as I say, actually, you know, getting a band into, into an arena um, and having it socially distanced, if that's one metre, then that's certainly achievable. Um, if it's two metres, it becomes more difficult, but it's still achievable. Um, the problem is um, you wouldn't want to be counter-marching a band out of a circle. You know, you'd, you'd be wanting to uh, stop the band where they are, get them all to turn around and walk out, um, still keeping the two metres between them all. 
um, you know, rather than and counter marching as we uh, as we normally do. So these are the sort of things that we that we have to think about. And John, would the RSPBA be taking advice, obviously following the government advice, but taking advice from any anyone else just now, um, any other bodies? Or? We'll take advice from anybody, Craig. You know, um, this is this is an unusual situation for us to be in as a fight ban community. We have never seen, or I'm, I'm unaware of us having anything like this ever before. Therefore, you know, we are not being um, standoffish at all. We will take advice and guidance from anyone. And Robert and I had a, had a good chat last night. Um, so, you know, we do need to get some clinical advice and that clinical advice needs to be uh, accurate. Um, the problem we have at the moment is uh, everyone's, everyone has a, an opinion, but what we don't have is a finite set of guidelines and, and restrictions that, that we need to put in place. And that's what we need to be able to drive us forward. But I think we must accept that there will be some restrictions on what we normally do uh, and we will not be able to perform as normal. Great. Um, here's a good one from Stephen about sheepskin bags. Would, Robert, would you see them posing uh, an increased risk um, of, of the virus? Um, and he's assuming that uh, mouth blowing other pipe chanters and moving tape are out of the question for now. Uh, yeah, interested in the sheepskin bag in particular. Yeah, well, as you might imagine, this has not been extensively studied. <laughs> so, but I mean, the first thing I would say is, yeah, mouth blowing other people's chanters is, is completely out of the question. And uh, as is being in the clo a close enough vicinity to be shifting uh, tape when pipes are still up, probably. Um, or definitely in that setting. Um, in terms of sheepskin bags, you know, the whole thing about we, we know that this virus um, spreads amongst workers in slaughterhouses where they're in a chilled environment. But there are other reasons in a slaughterhouse why virus might spread. People shout to each other over machinery. People tend to be in a closer vicinity. Social distancing falls apart, we know, in the workplace and that's in those sorts of settings. But it would seem intuitive in a way that if you've got something that's damp and that doesn't dry out completely between you know performances that you might be at a higher risk. Of, of virus lingering there. But I mean, we just don't know. And it's another reason to say, well, you know, if you've got a sheep's bit, sheepskin bag, when you finish playing, you take your water trap out, when you get home and you clean it and you wipe everything down and you, and you have it as, and you have all your reeds dried out, etc. afterwards. The sort of things that maybe we should be doing anyway, if we want to get the best sort of life out of our instrument. So yeah, it, it, you know, intuitively you might say, yes, it could do, but there's no way of, possibly sort of proving that or getting evidence. So I think you've just got to be sensible and safe. That's the, those are the two things, um, you know, and if you're handling someone else's pipes, you know, out with their social distance, then you make sure you wash your hands afterwards. You wash your hands beforehand and you wash your hands afterwards, you know, that sort of thing. Um, so what about the dangers of um, standing behind a player tuning their drones? This is what I've been thinking, even when we get back to normal and I'm in my little classroom. Um. I suppose that the, 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 the least um, infectious part of the, uh, of the bagpipe is the drones. The more infectious part is the chanter because of the, the, the volume of the, of the air that's coming through, as Robert discussed earlier. So it's low pressure coming out of the drones, but it's high pressure coming out of the chanter. So I, I think I'd be, I'd be wearing gloves and I'd be wearing a face shield if I was tuning somebody's drones, if I had to tune somebody's drones. Um, yeah. The other option is for them to tune their own drones and, and for them all to have a meter, you know, but that's not easy in itself, as we know. But uh, yeah, so that's, that's a challenge. Uh, I'm more worried about the poor bass drummer who's standing in the middle of a circle with everyone pointing their, their, their aerosol generating uh, instruments in his direction. You know, that, that, yeah. that worries me a little. That's a good point, Robert. Is that was that is that a concern if someone's everyone's facing the same the same person and the tenor drummers of course? Yeah, I mean I think this could be a good reason to get rid of drumming completely from the pipe band world. <laughs> it's just for you know since the birth of the pipe band. But yeah, I mean it's it's just so difficult to know because we don't know how many aerosols are being produced, and we know that you know within two meters most aerosols will have fallen to the ground and no longer be a problem. Um, if you're standing there, you're not be breathing them in. Um, but I think things like face shields are probably 
we, we've probably not acknowledged how good they are at stopping uh, cross-contamination um, in this country in terms of people using them widely. We use them in the hospital um, and we know they're very good for infection control, but it's the sort of thing, I think wearing a face shield and gloves if you were tuning drones, it would seem intuitively to be a good thing to do. Um, but you won't be able to go there until, you know, social distancing has been relaxed or unless there's certain guidelines that will allow you um, to do that at the moment, you know, someone's, people are just gonna have to tune their own drones. But I think we're still a bit off having organized pipe band gather, even practices at the moment, you know, we're still in a, in a suppress, suppressing phase with the virus. It's not fully suppressed. You know, we still have several cases per day in Scotland. We're doing very well compared to down south, but you know, at the moment, it's, uh, it would still be a no-no. But moving forward, I think you know, using PPE might be something that we all get used to. A um, couple of great questions from Gibber here, from Chris Gibb. Uh, John, can the RSPB see any positive changes to the structure of events resulting from COVID-19? And uh, do you see this as a, an opportunity for positive change? So I suppose we're talking permanent change here. Yes, I, I think there may be permanent change comes out of this. Um, what we haven't done is to say, right, that here's an opportunity to put in something we've thought about before. Um, we, we haven't taken that approach uh, and we are waiting to get, as I say, some guidance. But we, we know that the, the format of the, uh, the concert formation that, that we've used uh, in indoor contests, but also at some outdoor contests, works well and, and probably would be a, a, a factor in minimising any any spray coming from, from, from instruments because everyone's facing in the same direction. Um, and I know there is a, uh, there is a question going out uh, to, to, to grade one bands because the, the music board had a, um, had a view that it's time that we had a look at this and, and had a, re a real think about it. So there will be a, um, there will be a questionnaire coming out to grade one bands about, about that and whether um, that would work for a medley performance per se not particularly from an MSR performance. Um, so so there, is a, there is a willingness to look at that and to understand if, that is, if that's a, an improvement and that's, a, that's the way to go, um, but it's too early to tell at the moment. And just Robert, again, if we're talking, we were talking about temporary changes here, hopefully for the majority of things we're, we're discussing, but as, are the real risks of, of pandemics like this happen, occurring more regularly? You know, could this be something that we're looking at again in five or 10 years? Um, yeah, I mean, so I, I'm, I'm a respiratory doctor, so I, I deal with a lot of infectious diseases in terms of respiratory diseases, but the, the infectious diseases specialists have been waiting for this pandemic to happen for about 20 years. I mean, and, and they thought it was going to be a flu virus that was going to cause this sort of uh, devastation. It wasn't predicted it would be a coronavirus, but in the past... 10, 15 years, we've had two other outbreaks of different coronaviruses, one that caused SARS, which was far more lethal than the present coronavirus. So it didn't spread as quickly because people got it, got very sick and were admitted to hospital and didn't infect other people. And the Middle East, there was a thing called MERS, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, which was, believe it or not, um, the carriage for that bug, even though it was coronavirus, was camels but that had something like a 40 to 50% mortality rate for people that got it. So this risk is always going to be there. Um, and it gets worse when you think about, you know, the way we'd lead our lives in terms of international travel, et cetera, et cetera. So that's how things became, that's how things really got so bad so quickly because it, it, we probably didn't acknowledge as a world community early enough that this was a potential pandemic. We just thought it's a virus that's, affecting a small part of the world. So yes, it could happen again. Hopefully it's not going to happen again quickly, but we need to get rid of this. We're still, we're still in the middle of a pandemic at the moment. It's not going away. In other parts of the world, it's just kicking off. Another thing to bear in mind is you might read stuff in the newspaper saying that this was produced in a laboratory and it's a chemical weapon and all of that. And that is nonsense. This is a coronavirus that's come from animals. that's jumped into humans as it's happened before. And there's always the risk that will happen again. But we, hopefully with being a more mindful society, we will learn lessons that will um, minimise that risk in the future. Great, so if we're looking at the, the government advice, I see Andrew Shelley's asking about, you know, due to his own health, he's been shielding. Um, what 
what sort of phase of the government of the Scottish government's uh, schedule for things would we be thinking that we're getting back to um, back to banned practices, John? Well, we're phase three um, indicates that, uh, as I said earlier, the organised sport for children uh, begins to to happen. Uh, so that in itself means that you've got more than two household, households together, more than eight people. So, so that maybe lends itself to an indication that maybe that, that would be able to be translated into the juvenile pipe bands. Nothing on the adult side, you know, although we've got professional sport, which has now got the, the approval to, to go for football, we've seen nothing about contact sport uh, for, um, you know, for amateurs. Um, being anywhere in phase three. Um, phase four talks about mass gatherings. Um, again, those mass gatherings would probably still require social distancing. But I think if we're looking at phase three starting, you know, in July, we're probably looking at phase four starting um, end of August, I would think would be phase four. And there might be some things in there that would make practices a wee bit easier, but would likely to be outdoor, not indoor. Yeah, I think that's where we are. Yeah. So the message to um, those who are eager to get back is just hang fire, Robert. Yeah. Yeah, it's too too risky at the moment. As I say, I think thirteenth of July is the date for the uh, outdoor organised sport with, with the youngsters. Um, so we'll see see how that one transpires. Um, but then hospitality events indoors. Um, are scheduled for 15th of July as well. So, you know, we're starting to get a little bit of um, blurring of, the, of the, uh, the lines and of course it becomes more complex. You know, the more information we give people, the more difficult it is for people to understand what they should and shouldn't be doing. Uh, but as Robert says, it really is up to each individual to make sure that they are safe and that they're safeguarding others. I think the other thing to say is that the the easiest part of this for everyone was beginning lockdown because that was quite a simple message. You basically stop everything and you stay inside. And it's getting out of lockdown, which is the problem. And it's the problem everywhere where they've had to lock down. And, you know, it's a problem for us in healthcare as well that we've all kind of routine surgery, etc. was cancelled and all of those things. And it's how you get back to normality. So... It's, it seems like a, a good thing for me that the focus should be getting the kids back into um, practice and playing first, you know, they're the lowest risk and ultimately they are the most important people in this scenario because they're the future of pipe bands, you know. The rest of us can potentially take a bit of time to, you know, readdress what's important and uh, if we can get the kids back and it's safe, then ultimately the adult pipe band scene will, will come back from, from there. Um, now I had a question from Matt Wilson. John, would the, would the association be willing to invest in some sort of study to, to look into this sort of thing and um, how it's going to go forward? We we're certainly happy to engage with the, um, you know, with the clinical directors and, and the, the Scottish Government to, to ask the question. Uh, is, you know, what guidance can you give us specifically? Um, uh, certainly, I'll be speaking to uh, the Culture Secretary uh, in, in the not-too-distant future, um, asking for her advice and guidance as to who we should be speaking to. So I, I think if we if we have to have a test case or we have to look at specifically, uh, you know, a pipe band or, or, a, or a bike pipe for that matter, we'd be happy to do that. Okay. Uh, I mean... If anyone has any more questions, just keep them coming on the, the Q&A thing down the bottom here, because we're probably coming towards the end, it's about an hour. So um, I suppose my big, my big question, and I think it's probably what we're all really thinking uh, if we're sort of coming to the end of this, is we come back to school, all being well, we're, schools are full again um, come August, September. Um, I've got kids turning up to my classroom for piping lessons. Robert, what what needs to what needs to be happening? I mean, I'd imagine lots of us teaching little box, little box rooms, and um, have we to absolutely um, reject doing that sort of thing? Um, keep it going online as long as we can. What, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, it, it comes down to again individual situations and where we are, 
uh, as a sort of country at that point. I mean, if viral levels are continually suppressed and we're at a stage where pupils are back at school doing their normal day-to-day -day schoolwork um, without any restrictions, which might be the case eventually, then you might be able to do sort of one-on-one -on -one chanter practice and pipe practice, but you're going to have to mitigate the risk based on, you know, should, should you be doing it in a wee cupboard without a window? Uh, no, I wouldn't think so. <laughs> should you be... Should you be afforded a bit more respect to the Scottish National Instrument and have a nice big room to teach people? Yes, I think so. Um, but it might be you need to use things like face shield for pupil and teacher, et cetera, et cetera. And the other thing is you just need to, you need to be completely sure that each time you're doing a lesson that you've asked the question yourself, right, should I be teaching today? And you are asking the question, should this pupil be being taught today? Because that's what school teachers will have to do as well. And that's what we have to do every day when we're in the hospital, we get up and go to work is, should I be going to work today? Do I have symptoms? If I have symptoms, I need to go and get a test. And getting a test is horrific because we do almost do a brain biopsy with a swab. Um, so it's not something that you take lightly, but it's, you just have to do it. So. Everyone has to be of that mind if they're going to be interacting with other people in a close environment. But I'm hopeful we'll get back to some close to normality, you know, in a couple of months' time. Because the other thing is, acknowledging that the virus is there, you know, we do have to get back to some sort of normal life. Otherwise, we'll have no economy left in the country. We'll have a massive mental health problem. People will become unhealthy in other ways. So we need to sort of embrace the guidance we're given at a central government level and then calculate the risks for ourselves and then do things that are safe i mean that that's all that we can really say say about it yeah and if people are looking for more advice on these things i mean where might they look i mean i suppose that's to, to both of you um yeah are we going to have things published from the association for example or we, we, we will certainly be asking for guidance and, and anything that we get, we will freely publish. Um, what we have to be very careful of is giving advice. Um, what we can do is we can publish the guidance um, and then it's up to each individual and each band to consider what does that guidance look like for me and what, what, what can I and what can't I do on that. You know, I can't say, right guys, as of 13th of July, it's okay to, to, to have a band practice. I'm not in a position to say it, and I wouldn't say that because, as Robert says, each individual situation is, is unique. Um, you know, the, the, the size of the area you're using, um, how many people you've got, whether those people are healthy or not, these are all uh, factors that you need to consider for yourself. And just something I'm interested in, if, if you felt, if the association felt that a band were doing something they really shouldn't be, would would you be able to step in as a, as a sort of governing body and, and suggest we, we, things, or is that not this? It, it's not, we're not, we're not a police force as, as such, but we, we, if people were raising concerns with us about an incident like that, then we would speak to the, you know, to the people involved. Um, but then our, uh, our society, our piping and drumming society, uh, are not shy at coming forward anyway. So I'm sure that other people would be telling um, those particular people that they weren't acting in the best interest of, uh, of uh, piping and drumming, rather than me having to do it. <laughs> yeah, and I think just, just to come back to what, just it, it comes back to the point, at the moment, you know, there is no danger that anyone will be having a band practice. <laughs> so if there's anyone out there that thinks that they can do that and it's going to give them a head start for next season, they're living in a fantasy land you know the government the government guidance and advice is there if you had a band practice you could you know the police could turn up and uh, send you on your merry way or worse so you know that all those all those kind of uh, all that guidance is there for a reason is to protect you and to protect society so we just take we take each sort of re relaxation in the lockdown as it comes and then we assess risk for ourselves and others at, at each point but um and if the rspb would like to give me approximately 1.5 million pounds we could do all the experiments we need to do in the next couple of weeks <laughs> i'd love to <laughs> great well if if we don't have anything else uh, from those listening in uh, i would just like to thank anyone who's contributed with a question uh, and 
sincere thanks to Robert and John who've given up their afternoons uh, to speak to us all. Certainly, I've got some ideas for risk assessments I'm going to be filling out. Uh, finally, to Alison Duffy, who is our pipe band secretary and a marketing secretary at the school, who's one of these people we all work with who goes above and beyond and, and helps out with anything she can do, even in the first week of the summer holidays. Um, so thanks to Alison. And uh, yeah, thank you everyone for hopefully that's hopefully that's been useful, and hopefully see you all soon. And thanks, Craig, for organising. Not at all. The pleasure. Very useful, Craig. A pleasure. Thank you very much.